give me what I want Now you got me in the rip diet, drinking sunshine all right, everybody, welcome to Chameleon Cuts, episode five. Our next guest is the ultimate chameleon. He's rocking a multitude of shades, talents, and accomplishments. He's a record producer, recording and mixing engineer, an author, a technical writer, an instructional designer, and an educator. Recognizing his works with accomplished acts such as Pat Benatar, Enrique Iglesias, Ray Charles, Mick Jagger, The Beach Boys, Emmerich Rubin, the list goes on and on and on. <laughs> Barry's been credited on more than 30 RIAA certified gold and platinum records. Barry's a lifetime Grammy voting member of the National Association of the Recording Arts and Sciences. And in 97, he began writing monthly for technical reviews for Mix Magazine. And then over 30 years, you've been a columnist for Music Connection Magazine under the New Toys segment. And then you're a content creator for Sonarworks, a music tech company that bridges the gap between sound creators and listeners. Okay, guys. And then your Gearless website where you review various audio equipment and tools. And you're also an AES member. I'm not done yet, guys, <laughs> which is the audio engineering society that promotes the science and practice of audio by bringing leading people and ideas together. And you're the owner of Music Mixer Tones for Dollar Studio in NoHo. It's called is- Tones. Tones, tones for dollars. For dollars, yeah. Yep, T- tones for dollars. Oh, number four, dollar sign. The dollar symbol. <laughs> mm-hmm. So please welcome Barry Rudolph. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Of course. I'm glad to help you out and help your audience out. And um, honestly, uh, uh, I think I I think I've been pretty lucky in my life. There's a uh, there's luck, and then there's being ready to. Uh, have the luck i think yeah. is the way to put it so uh ask away um i'm yours. All right, great thank you so much for being here so for our watchers out there the aim in today's interview is to be talking about the science of sound and production concepts and how to discover your career path and we're going to talk about barry's journey and how he got started and how you can too and barry i wanted to dedicate this episode to rupert neve who recently passed oh, and is a true so legend of the audio industry yes and i have my very, very, very loved and treasured Rupert Neve espresso cup from when I, from when I uh, interned that oh. year at Nam when oh. we saw each other at Nam, and I had the pleasure of taking a part and putting together a fifty eighty eight. So yeah. <laughs> that was really fun. So thank you. That's Rupert the console, Neve. right? Yeah. Yes, the console, mm-hmm. yeah. The console right? Yeah, right. they have one of those at MI. Yes, in Studio D. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I just wanted to read a quick quote about that. So this is from the the Guardian. So uh, essentially, Neve reflected on one of his earliest innovations and said, um, you, uh, the quote, it went like this, the art from the article, The Guardian, you bring a bunch of musicians in, make a recording, and they find that the guitar is kind of lost. So what do you do? You bring in all the musicians again, scouring various nightclubs and so on, into which they've all disappeared over the last week, get them all together again and re-record, very expensive and difficult. So a revolution was needed. And is, was there any way that we could change that mix? He asked himself. And then, well, that's when EQ occurred to him. So EQ, guys, for those of you who don't know, or equalization, the process of managing and balancing different frequencies within a sound, giving it more or less bass, perhaps, or cutting out certain disruptive harmonics. It allows sounds and instruments to fit together in a mix and is an essential component of mixing consoles. Neve's signature EQ design would become one of his flagship achievements, precipitating what would become known as the Neve sound. So I thought that was cool. I wanted to, to read that. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. That's very nice. The Neve sound. Yeah. The Neve sound. So mm-hmm. Barry, there's, there's so many wonderful accolades that you have. And like you said, you've had this amazing, extensive career and there's so many things I want to ask you, but quick question that I want to get out of the way immediately is the Grammys are right around the corner. And who do you think has a great shot at winning this year? <laughs> oh, I have, you know, I've I voted. I have to look up who I voted for. I'm a, I'm a lifetime member of voting. Yep. Member. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I have my, ch- my choices. I have my ideas about who's going to win. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of things that go into winning a grammy it's not mm. you have to look at the categories the way that they do the voting the coast so what do they do other voting they have a a nomination process and then they have the pre-vote which is essentially you 
you uh, all the nominations come in and then you have to vote. You have five, usually five or six uh, picks to choose from and you have to pick one. So that whole process takes happens over quite a few months. And um, my choices are usually I look at the, the nominees and I listen to everything mm-hmm. uh, all the way through. And uh, I pick from that choice of five nominees. I'm not saying they're the best singer or the best record or anything like that in the whole world. I'm saying with those five choices, between those five choices. So remember right. that one, because a, a lot of records win you've never even heard of. And, and that's the reasoning. So they get nominated and then enough people significantly vote for them. So uh, okay. I, I'd have to look at my picks. If you're interested, I can go back there and find them and see what I picked. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to make you give away all of your, all of your. Oh, secrets. well, it doesn't, I mean, it, it, I mean, I just watched the show. I remember it got, it got postponed, which is starting to make, they're already about a, over a year late when you see the, the show on TV, all that music, all those records or whatever are all about a year old. Right. Because right. of the they process. Are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There is a, uh, there's a starting time when you can start voting and then an ending time end of that. And then they got, then the show is usually ending time is usually around uh, December or so. Mm-hmm. And then the show, usually it's the, it's the Sunday before the Academy Awards is the way it's been right. working. Academy Awards is the last show. And Grammys right. is the Sunday before. So you're looking at usually around the end of February. Right. But it's moved to March now. So it's going mm-hmm. to be different. It's going to be different. And, and uh, we'll see. Yeah, you know? we'll see. So. Have they decided if it's going to be a virtual event yet or if it's going to be... Oh, the, the show will be online, I think. That's one of the reasons why they postponed it, because they couldn't do it right. live. We'll see how, how virtual and how good it is. I have no idea. You mm-hmm. know, I've been a few times. I've, I've been there to cover it, cover the show, the, the technology and how they do it. Pretty interesting for Mix Magazine. And wow, it's, it's cool. pretty complicated. And they have a new director uh, now starting this year. So that's going to be interesting. His that person's take of all of it versus the last guy. Wow. Yeah. There's got to be lots of channels and things going on because you're talking about audio, not just for performers, but audio for the hosts and the interviews and the VJs and everything. There's so much. Yeah. Going on. And that whole, the whole format I think is probably going to be somewhat, somewhat different this time because of the new director. Mm. And, and so we'll see. It'll be interesting. He's definitely under the gun. We'll see what happens. So yeah. how many months do you typically get to make a choice on who you want to nominate? Um, let me think about that. You start picking them. I'm going to say about the end of summer. I'm probably wrong on this. Let's say three months total. Wow. Okay. You, the nomination period and then the, the so you can write in your nominees, like uh, best artists. Right. There'll be 500 choices for the first ballot, 500. So there's a series of ballots before you, that come yeah, in so initially. Well, one, this, the big ballot might have 500, say for best new artists or something, or no, say record of the year, which is the top, the top record. Record of the year is, is a production, songwriting, engineering, it's everything. Record of the year. And that would have like 400 nominee, well, 400 in the long list. You vote on the ones you like, and then that'll get boiled down to five for the final ballot. Wow. For me, I was very interested in the pop and R&B categories. And I remember that when we were over one time, we had checked out a couple of Dua Lipa records together because you were looking last year and you were seeing yeah. who you were going to you know, vote for yeah. then. And, you know, Taylor Swift came out with a great album. Post Malone mm-hmm. had a lot of great songs. There's a lot of a lot of stuff going on. I don't know if any if that sparks any. Um, yeah, I mean, Dua, Dua is up for about six different things. Um, and I, I like her a lot. And I feel like she got short change last, last Grammys. I feel like Dua got short, shorted out. I forget what the issue was. Some, oh, uh, mm. it was, what's the girl, uh, Billy. 
had all those had all those awards and kind of overshadowed and no one looked at Dua and Dua had just come out and and I kind of felt bad about that I I voted for her, but I I I, uh, I um, couldn't believe how many that Billie Eilish 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 how many she won I mean and and her and her brother that's crazy it's like a sweep which is another thing you don't get me started but I don't like sweeps I don't think anybody mm. should get more than one Grammy but that's just not going to happen. Mm. You know, it's really I think, interesting. I think somebody, I, I, for me, I would like to have a, a Naris to have a committee that decides, okay, we got all these votes for this, this, and that. Now you got to decide whether or not that artist, that team, whatever it's, it was it the best song of the year, which is a songwriter award, or was it best record of the year? You know, you have to you have to decide what it was best at. I don't know, but it, probably an impossible. For sure, impossible. because I mean, you know, for anyone voting, it's got to be kind of a difficult decision because it's like, what do you what do you go based off of, right? Are you looking at? I mean, everybody's well, got a different opinion on what a good song is, right? Yeah. Well, the song song of the year. I mean, it's like that's pretty cut and dried about what ends up being. I mean, it's the you know, it's the usual, not the usual, but it's the song that. Is touching the most people. Not everyone can win one, and I'm, there's lots of discussion and and you know comment about how come that person gets a Grammy and this person over here doesn't. But right. it's like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know why why are some of those people in it and other really good rockers like Pat Benatar are not? Right. You know? Right. All right, Bear. So let's rewind a little bit, okay? So. Mm-hmm. And again, because of all your accolades, I really had to think in my own heart and mind about what I really wanted to extract from you and from this this chameleon cut and what I thought would be a value, Mm -hmm. strong value to my watchers. So I wanted to, I personally wanted to rewind. And and what's interesting to me is that you have a degree in science and you built a PA system at a very young age, as well as winning a science fair for building a radio transmitter with parts from a war surplus store. Yeah, that was fifth grade. So, and that was amazing. (laughs) Well, I mean, look, one of the things you, you do when you're young and hopefully with some guidance by somebody older, Mm -hmm is figure out what you really like. What do you like to do? What do you, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be like a job. It could be, in my case, it was a hobby. The, the electron, the interest in electronics came from a hobby. That was amateur radio, you know, where you talk to other people all over the world. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's where the interest in electronics came from. And um, you have to figure out what do you, you know, what, what gets you going? What, what do you like to do? What, what is, what becomes, uh, you become obsessive about almost you obsess over and what do you want to really do in life? When you're a young person, you don't necessarily know that at all. So young people go to schools, they go to college, try to figure it out. They, they try all different things. And that's probably really the key is to, Mm. is to keep, uh, keep open and keep trying. And it all comes back down really is how hard you're willing to work at something. Do you For really sure. want this? How you know? How bad do you really want to do that? Yeah. And and uh, I mean, I'll just relate. When I first met you at MI, you came into open counseling. You remember this? Mm-hmm. And you yep. were trying to figure out <laughs> what you were going to do. Yeah. And that's the thing. A lot of a lot of students in school don't have a, a forward look or reach beyond where they are in school. It's very important to develop what you're going to do next. Yeah. Okay. What is your plan? You know, what is your plan? So you, you're in high school, maybe you say, okay, I'm going to go to junior college mm-hmm. when you because I, it's, it's cheaper for me to get those first two years in junior college. For the most part, you can transfer those to a four-year college and save money, let's say. So that's what I did because my father told me, my sister had gone to college. She went to a girl's school, a really expensive boarding school and all that. And yeah. my dad said, well, you want to go to college? And I said, yeah. And he goes, have a good time. <laughs> and that went nothing, you know? So I had to put myself through college. Anyway, that's another story, but right. I, 
I, so anyway, I wanted to go to college because I wanted to learn about electronics and get an engineering degree. Okay. Mm. So that's why I went to college. So, so, so yeah. around, around what age or time in your life did you get specifically interested in some music and the science of sound and, and why? Well, I was in a rock and roll band in high school. Oh, so we're looking at junior year, uh -huh. uh, sophomore year, something like that. And uh, right. we were in a, we were in a band and we covered, you know, we, this is the time of the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to, used to sit in my, my friend's house down the street and we'd look at a, we'd look at a life magazine or one of those magazines had a picture of the Beatles and we go, man, look at these guys. That haircut, man. <laughs> these guys wow. We, we just thought they were lame at first. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, but we ended up uh, covering their songs that and the Rolling Stones and, and, uh, we happened to happen to meet a, a kid about our age who knew all the lyrics and he was a singer and a rhythm guitar player and he had okay. a beetle haircut already and <laughs> he was in the band and uh so yeah that was i was a drummer not very good and wow. and uh, so i played drums we play at high school dances and, <laughs> and stuff like that and the, the pa system came about because of that again it was a response to something we needed and that was a was a, a pa system to sing out of because we had a singer now before we were just a surf band mm -hmm. so surf bands just play instrumentals right so didn't need a vocal <laughs> <laughs> so very um, cool very yeah. cool so it all it's all respond it all is responding to a need i guess in that case mm -hmm. definitely so I read on your Wikipedia that you said you were interested in what made certain records sound better to you than others. Yep. And can you talk in depth about that? Like, are we referring to cadences resolving and more settling places to the ear in like Western music regard, so to speak, or the subconscious tones and semantics that our bodies crave are sort of vastly respond to? And it's not, there's uh, it's not deep. It's not deep. You put on a record and you go, God, I love that vocal sound. How do they get right on? I love it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not deep. I mean, because emotionally it's going to be different for every listener. You know, I could, I could say, yeah, I like that guy's voice and I like mm -hmm. the words. Mm -hmm. uh, and another person might go, Oh man, that guy sucks. You know, it looks terrible. I don't like his tone. I don't like it. <laughs> so that stuff is more subjective. Uh, right. I was interested in, in being able to get, those kinds of sounds and how they did that. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was something that I was interested all through those times in the band and through, uh, through college days. And uh, I would listen to records and, and I didn't really, I mean, I used to work nights. See, when you work your way through college, you got to come up with some, some money. So I, I was working at a, uh, a couple of different aerospace companies uh, at night where I would, I would was going to Long Beach University and I would mm -hmm. drive from from Long Beach to Anaheim. I would say my senior year at university was all I could do to get through it because mm. what I was doing at nights uh, for these companies that were contracted by NASA and other mm -hmm. was way beyond what my physics teacher and those kind of classes were doing in college. It was like kind of stupid. And, uh, Can you talk about like exactly what you had? What were you testing and what, what kind of systems? Oh, oh, oh uh, I worked. Uh, one of the companies I worked for at night was called uh, Astrodata. What huh. they build was uh, time, okay, time code generators and synchronizers, which, you know, when they do a when they do a uh, space shot and you got a satellite or more importantly, uh, 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 a capsule with astronauts in it. They have to know at any moment all over the world the exact time because certain processes are timed to go to a certain time, you know, like this has got to happen exactly at this time. <sighs> yes, so yes. All of those That's sequences have to be synchronized all over the world because it's, the radio signals take time and to get anywhere, of course, radio signals like light take uh, time to propagate, to move from point A to point B. So mm -hmm. I worked at a company that made the very super accurate time code generators, which would synchronize all the listening stations all over the world, Australia, uh, South Africa, um, America, of course, Europe, they all had listening stations that, because 
the earth is here, the set, the capsule is going around the earth. Well, if, if you, the globe is like this and it's turning, <laughs> so if the United <laughs> States is here and it's over here, they're not going to be able to communicate. So they have to go through a, a, a ground station and then it's relayed. Anyway, I worked at a station and all that stuff. And I worked in quality uh, control, quality assurance. So that's I'm the awesome. Guy. I'm the guy that would test this before it went out the door. We also did other things like we worked we worked uh, for Disney for the animatrons, you know, the robots, you know. Like, yeah, sure. This is Abraham Lincoln, you know, and all that electronics too that was in there. Very cool. Now, had you envisioned which career that you wanted to fully commit to? Like once no. you completed your college study, you didn't. Okay. No, and this is this is a very important important thing, an important pivot point, important realization that what you start out thinking, this is what I want to do. And had it not been for me getting laid off or fired from a, from a job, you know, same kind of work, different company. Um, and I was able to collect unemployment for a while. In the meantime, I wandered into a recording studio in Orange County. We're talking 1969, 68, mm -hmm. 69. And I walked in there and I saw the console and I, you know, I go, they were doing music. You know, wow, this is happening. <laughs> and they hired me for like uh, that place in Orange County. Uh, yeah. Hired me for not very much money, but I got, man, this is awesome. And I was an assistant. I didn't sit down and fly the plane. All right. And then from there, you moved on to assisting in Larrabee. Yep, went up. Well, I had heard about Larrabee changed hands. Uh, and I heard about that from a guy who was working at the studio. How's that? Because the guy that I worked for uh, had a lot of problems. And that's a whole other side story if you want to mm. hear some of that. But <laughs> but anyway, I, I had to move on and I went up to uh, heard about this and I got a job at Larrabee for 50 bucks a week. Wow. And at Larrabee, you had legendary mixers like Dave Pensado and Manny Moroccan, and you started cutting demo acetate discs there. At right? that time, yeah, that's how the publishers would get their music. The, then they moved to cassettes and then they, you know, CDs. But yeah, originally they would have a, an acetate of the songs and they would, they would phone in an order, order in the morning, you know, like pizza. And I would go in there and dig out they had cop tape copies upstairs at larrabee and i would go up get the songs and stack them up and cut them all and then they'd pick them up around noon or whatever they said so yeah that's how they did it wow. yeah you know and talking about analog versus digital and how far we've come are you just mm -hmm. mind blown by it and i know that you, you love you love all of your audio gear and all the audio toys that you get to play with all the time because, you know, it's a huge part of what you do aside of you're the ultimate chameleon. You're not just producing and mixing. You're also reviewing stuff and you're talking about what you like and what things that you, you know, don't like as much and things that work for you. So uh, what do you think about where things have gone today? Like, are, are you happy? I think it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic. Listen, uh, no, there's never been a time when more people had access to the equipment to, to be able to record themselves and do their own thing. Yep. However, there are some things to, to note. It's, it's such a changed business. So all the people around my age or so are all lamenting the good old days, you know, with big budgets and big studios and all mm. those times and everything. But I'm sorry, those, those days are over and I'm okay with it. Unlike a lot, I, I I like to work with younger people. I like, the, I like the new technologies, of course. I like, I don't ever want to rewind a tape recorder again in my life. And, and it's hard for somebody your age to really understand that because you've, mm. you, you've never done that. But I've sat yeah. for hours doing nothing but rewind, four measures, punch in, rewind, six measures, take me right out on the chorus, on the downbeat of the chorus and punch in. I don't want to do any of that stuff again, ever. I know we're so spoiled. My generation is so spoiled. I don't know like... if spoiled is quite. <laughs> I don't. I am Maybe because I, I'm spoiled because I did it back in the day, and now I, I use Pro Tools, so I, I'm spoiled. <laughs> I don't want to go back to those days. I had a friend of mine wants to record all analog with nothing but tubes, and I go, "Okay, I got a lot of that." And I said, "Are we going to use a tape deck?" And he goes, "No, we'll go to Pro Tools." <laughs> so, 
everybody just loves Pro Tools. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. So I, I don't, I don't, I feel spoiled. You guys should not feel spoiled. <laughs> you guys should be pushing that whole, younger people should be pushing those types of technologies to the limit and, and asking how come I can't do this and really get in there and get good at it. And that's what, that's what learning a, a system like Pro Tools or Logic or any of them really, that's where it becomes like an instrument. Like you're using it yeah. like a musical instrument. So absolutely, I love that progressive mentality. So what were, what, or tell me what was your biggest challenge getting started at Larrabee or maybe some obstacles that you faced, if, if any? Well, Larrabee, it, when I started at Larrabee, I had already been doing regular sessions back in Orange County studio. But right. when I started there, uh, yeah, you basically had to start over. So I was, you know, it was a toilet jam, a toilet engineer. <laughs> clean the, this is before, this is, this is different times, but I don't, I didn't clean the toilet all the time. I just say, <laughs> you know, basically, you know, getting coffee and just being totally subservient. Then when they feel like they can trust you, then I got the disc cutting gig, you know, we're back in the room cutting mono acetates, which it's fun. It's kind of interesting, but it's not much you can do there other than spoil these acetate discs. They're 10 inches in diameter, but wow. I did have a, a Poltec EQ. I did have a, a, a Fairchild compressor and you could fool around with those and see what those did. And, and as long as you got your work done and didn't spoil too many acetates, because uh, there's more to disc cutting than just, it's a lathe. It's a mechanical system and you right. You have to do it just right or else it just doesn't work. So the, I had some opportunities to experiment, but I'd already been doing experimentation down in Orange County. I'd already cut several records, several whole albums, you know, and had the whole first engineer thing, which um, I happened awesome. into totally, totally. Uh, this is kind of a kind of a story. The owner and chief engineer had a drinking problem. Okay. And so he was erratic. And he used to, in, there was a bathroom right by the control room doors, right outside the control room door, there was a, the doorway to the bathroom. In the bathroom, he would keep a refrigerator full of beer. And he would tell the client that he had like a urinary whatever issue and he had to urinate often, like every about 10 minutes. And oh would, my God. <laughs> and he would, he would go, he would go in there and pee out the one he just drank and drink another one at the same time. You Holy think the guy smokes. has a problem? And he would do that all day long, all day long. And a couple, a, of mints, <laughs> a couple of breath mints and he was good to go. And he come back in a session. Well, this is a big high pressure session. We were doing orchestral recordings. Guy, people, the guys came down from LA. They were like Hollywood film guys. And, and I'm second engineering. The producer said, man, we're getting hungry. Let's We'll take you out to eat. Let's go. And so the, the guy, <laughs> I'm ready to go. The guy would go one more trip to the bathroom and he did his deal, but he didn't come back. So the oh, chief no. engineer who was doing the session, recording everybody, I'm just running the tape recorder. He disappeared. And so they said, where, where is he? Let's go. We're hungry. So I go and I find uh -huh. him and he's passed out. He's wow. passed out on the floor. And he says, dude, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I finished the session. I came back and I told the guys he wasn't feeling well. And he said to go on without us. And uh, I came back and I finished the session. They got their tapes. They're all happy. They left about 11 o'clock at night. And they left. And the next day, the owner says, okay, you're doing all the sessions. Because he just wanted to stay drunk, I guess. So that's how I started. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. You see, so things, things, oh, unexpected things always happen. You get thrown into things on the fly, especially in this industry a lot, I feel like. How you react, how well. you handle uh, situations uh, that are good for everybody. I think if you just keep in your mind that you, it's a, it's a service-oriented business. Mm. Service-oriented business. So being a recording engineer or producer, you're in service to the artist. If you're a producer, well, the artist and the song. So when you hire an arranger, he's in service to actually the song, you know, 
if you hire a mixer, you're supposed to be in service of, you know, the genre and the, and the mix. So once you get away from that and start making it, you're the focus, then you're probably kind of in trouble. <laughs> yeah. And Barrett, if you could go ahead and just explain the distinctions between the different roles, because I, I know that there's a lot of kind of confusion about the difference. Like there actually is confusion between the differences between a recording engineer, a mastering engineer, a mixing engineer, and yeah. all of these things. A lot, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of producers nowadays, especially young and up and coming, we tend to wear all the hats, you know, and that's not a bad thing. The way music is produced nowadays compared to when I started, when I started, there were many more roles and you had experts in each role. So uh, today, because of budget and the technology, you have one person that can do everything if they're talented. So a producer, okay, if I use the kind of the old school, old school term, the producer is the guy or the people who organize the sessions they might be hiring an engineer to record it. They might be hiring a studio or they have their own studio. They might be hiring an arranger to write uh, string and, and brass parts, for example, or even backing vocal parts can all be written out, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, they run the whole show. So the producer is akin to the director <laughs> on a film or TV, except he also can have an expanded role. But usually the producer in a film shoot is the money people or the executive producer, and he lines up the financing and all that for the movie. But in a record production, if, if you're with a label, the label is responsible for those charges. However, now even that's, that's uh, changes around. So producer really is more about organization, the whole thing, the whole session. Producers also write songs. I worked for many producers back, back in the day that also wrote uh, the songs they were recording. Yeah, and would, Max Martin, for example. Right. They would, they would pitch, uh, they would pitch a song that they wrote, or maybe their crew wrote uh, for a particular artist. So it's it's a broader it's a broader uh, definition nowadays with for producer. Um, mm. Then you have an engineer, and a lot of engineers are also producers. This is where the so you could be an engineer, like I am. And I have a studio, but I don't consider myself a producer because I, a producer, a producer is a person that can play a musical instrument or program or whatever can can make sounds, make beats, whatever that that are good, and also uh, engineer it as well. So you have this producer engineer or engineer producer. I'm sort of an engineer producer because I get asked to co-produce. I just did a remix, and so they they want my input in terms of everything really. And uh, so an engineer usually is, uh, if, if more like back, back in the day, which you're concerned with sounds, getting sounds, recording, making sure stuff sounds good. That's the engineer's gig. The producer guides the engineer. He might say something, maybe he's non-technical and he says, look, I'd really like, I'd like to get the bass sound like on this record. He'd give a prototype, which is the way to do it, by the way. Right. If you have a particular idea for a guitar sound, or uh, anything really, and you don't really know too much about recording engineering, just start making a clip, maybe a, a verse. I really like the vocal sound in the verse here and you, whatever it is, just make sure it's apples and apples. You know, you, <laughs> you, don't, you don't like the, the vocal sound in a verse from Metallica and then try to compare it to an R&B verse, you know? So, so apples and apples. Mm, and, that would be a challenge. Yeah. So, <laughs> So, or, or other thing. I mean, so yeah, so producer, engineer, and then engineer, producer, mastering, mastering uh, originally was a whole separate thing. You would finish your mix, you would have a stereo tape, or today a wave file, stereo wave file. The mastering engineer is responsible for the commercial side, the actual manufacturer. In th these days, it's streaming. So mm -hmm. with streaming, it has to be a certain loudness, those kinds of things. A mastering engineer would also sequence it, put, you say, I want this song and then this song, and then if they're doing an album and I want this much space between them. And I, I want to, I want to cross fade, meaning as the one song's fading out, the, uh, the second song is coming in, stuff like that. That's what mastering engineers do technically. Yeah, back in the day, vinyl cutting a, a disc was much more serious 
uh, undertaking and many more places for it to go wrong. Plus, if, it, if, the, if the original cutting master, which is cut on the lathe, like I started on, if there's a problem there, when they will press up 100,000 dead vinyl, you know, that don't work, skip. So much more responsibility when it comes to vinyl. High stakes. Yeah. So was yeah. that all I, did I answer it all? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, I'm very, I'm very happy to talk about the differences because, you know, for me as a vocalist too, when I work with people and they tell me what they're qualified to do and it's just there, there is a very specific distinction between those, those things. And I, I think it's really important to point that out. And so also, you know, honor people who are experts in those, in those different things, because, you know, yeah, they are different. Like I say, because of time and budget, budgets and time those kind of get blurred into one right universe. and talking about budget i'm glad you brought that up because you know because obviously it depends if you're going to like a seasoned mastering engineer what they're going to charge you um i i know somebody who is i think an excellent producer and pretty good mastering engineer i mean if you play if you play his music it sounds like it could be on the radio. I'm just going to generalize and say that, but it, it really does. And he's charging $150 to mix the whole song. If you have it already recorded and are sending him your stems mm -hmm. and then $50 to master it. Now I want to know how does that register in your brain in terms of what you are used to, you know, cause I've, I've seen some mastering charges up to $5,000, you know, again, what is an old expression? You kind of, you charge what you can get. So if you're a, a venerable mastering engineer with quite a reputation and, um, you know, like, like my friend, um, she's up for three Grammys again. She's usually all you, Emily, all right. uh, Emily. And, uh, you know, people want her to master their stuff because it'll come out good. So she's tending to master artists and, you know, that have a shot at becoming big. Emily Lazar is her name. Okay. So you she might want to Emily. Google it. <laughs> Very yeah, cool. L-A-Z-A-R. Yeah. So she's really nice. And I, I get why people want to have her do it. So she's, I don't know what she charges. It, it just kind of, you kind of, if you want her to do it, then you pay what she, what she gets. That's it. There's right. not really, you don't try to negotiate. Right. You know, yeah. Uh, if you're a big star, you don't get a deal. <laughs> right. And speaking of big stars, working with Patty, as you call her, yeah. the legendary Pat Benatar, I know you guys are tight and she gave you that awesome compressor that you showed me. What was it like working with her? I'm a huge fan of Patty. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, the husband. I'm calling Neil. her Patty too now. <laughs> Neil uh, Spider. Neil gave me the compressor. Mm -hmm. um, it let me see if you can see it. Oh, it's too out of view here. It's right here. But anyway. Mm -hmm. um, he goes by Spider, you said? Her husband? Spider, yeah. All right. Neil Geraldo, mm -hmm. a.k.a. Spider. Um, she's awesome. I mean, unbelievable. When I can, I, I've been down there to record here several times, I, uh, different mics, everything, vocal booths. And she is uh, remarkable. She's just so good. She just put the mic up in front of her and it's not really much to do. And I imagine her being a very convicted singer who's kind of really sure of what she wants when she gets in the booth. Like, but she's like, got she's it. Not really. you know, she's got it. I've only worked with a few singers like that that can just go out on the mic and you push up the fader to go, are we in record? I mean, she's got it. You know, Daryl Hall, he's got it. He's one, he's like, one take he doesn't like to do more than one take and what's it like for you when you get to work with a singer like that um easier <laughs> you love it well sure you love it? <laughs> sure it's not like you have to uh, uh think about how you're going to fix it so that's that's what that's the fallacy or, that is the fallacy is a human nature i think to want to fix things it's sort of a it's sort of a what do you call it uh add kind of thing you, right, you, a little compulsion. You, you, mm -hmm. it's so compulsive to say oh wow what right there you know you're, you're zero you're microscopically looking 
that's something because of course Pro Tools blows out the waveform across your screen. You can see every <laughs> every you know, little every, thing, every little breath, breath or every single. And so <laughs> there's this compulsion. Well, I got to fix that. I got to fix that. I got to get rid. You know, and uh, it's it's really kind of wrong. Um, mm. It's really kind of a wrong tendency, and it would be nice if people looked at more uh, the bigger picture of what it is. So you have a singer, maybe he's a little flat in a couple of places. If it's really egregious, tune those notes only. If it's really bugging you. Like right. me, I get, I get kind of, if I hear the same thing go by while you're mixing and you know, you kind of, after a while, it kind of bugs you. Yeah. So I'll just go in there and tune that one note. If it's just like one little note and it just makes, it just makes my day a little smoother and nicer because I'm not hearing that flat note every time we go by that place, you know? Yes. So, but if we have a singer that is, that is, uh, that's their thing. They don't, they sing a little under consistently all the time. That's their thing. Mm. So you have to decide if you're okay with that and work with them or you're not okay with that and say next, next case and leave. That's brilliant, Barry, because I, I mean, when I listen to older records, I do hear that stuff and I'm just sure. like, was this intentional or was this a creative choice by the producer and the singer and the engineer? Was this a collective kind of, I mean, okay, I'll bring up one artist, Alanis Morissette, and I, you know what I mean? She, God, she was such a, her, her it was all about the story of her music. Everything had a story and a really strong emotional meaning behind it. So like, you're going to go in there and fix all that stuff, but she's pouring her soul out and you can feel it. So it's like, it doesn't need to be shiny and tidy all the time. No, I mean, that's also, that's context you're talking about and mm -hmm. what she's singing about. What is she wanting to say? So a perfectly in tune it, Alanis Morissette on a lot of those songs wouldn't sound better. I'll just say that it would not sound better. It would sound different, but right. it would sound better. So really, again, that is a producer tuning is a producer's gig. And I get stuff all the time that's out of pitch and I'll bring it up and I'll say, uh, and they kind of either don't hear it a or B expect you to fix it. And I'm not going to do that because that is a producer gig that's a responsibility of a producer an artistic decision right and everything so i love that we're talking about this because i do want to call out those producers that have a compulsion to just completely auto-tune an entire and an, oh I'm just, I'm just gonna put it on there just in case it's happened oh, to you, me in a session i'm like well was there something off pitch well i'll just put it on there just in case no 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 <laughs> like, <laughs> well, that's sort of a lazy that's a lazy approach you know, um, and, and for some of them, it's not even that they're li being lazy. It's that it's they're uneducated and don't actually because so many people do that. They think it's just like a standard thing to do. Mm -hmm. And they're just not aware of like, hold on, like, let's go back and listen and feel mm -hmm. and talk about what know. you're talking about, the context. Which no, is they so don't want to be they don't want to be bothered. Maria, they just don't want to be bothered. They don't want to take the time. They just want to slap something on there that's kind yeah, of OK right. and move on and get the check. I mean, honestly, it's, it's, uh, t you can do, of course, auto tune has an automatic mode where you can put it on there, put the key of the song or a chromatic mm -hmm. or whatever. And it will, I, I do that sometimes in backing vocals. So like a backing vocal is might be four or five, six tracks. And so that they aren't too out of pitch with one another. I'll do that for quick, but for lead vocal, that's different. No, you got to go in there and, and figure out what do I tune, what needs or what needs to be tuned, and then what do I want to tune, and what does it do to the vibe? And and mm. you know, auto tune is not without uh, a sonic difference. Melodyne is the best tuning, of course, but auto tune has an automatic. And I'm talking about now auto tune records. That's something else. So well, yeah. Just, Right, right, right. We're, we're, just to be clear, guys, we're not referring to like the Jamie Foxx blame it on the alcohol tea pain stuff. We're talking about just like correcting a note in a song, yeah, yeah. not exactly. going over. Yeah. When I use the, the term auto tune, thing. I would, I, I, if you're going for the effect like tea pain, like you say, tea pain, there's whole plugins that are built that way. You can buy a plugin, put it on a vocal, and it'll sound like tea pain. It'll do that same uh, craziness. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so, um, Again, it is a producer and artist decision to do that stuff. And I, my belief is it should remain that way because an engineer or somebody that's getting, getting paid just to mix your stuff, I don't know.
there are varying levels of, of uh, expertise in that area. So I'm not going to say all engineers would do it or mm -hmm. all, you know, but, sure. but really, why do you have to, you're, you're presenting files to somebody to mix that have problems already. And uh, that's just not conducive to getting a good mix, in my opinion. Sure. So Barry, you also got a gold certification for show and tell by Al Wilson in 73. How did that feel? It was fantastic. That guy, let me tell you, that guy was everywhere. For a month, you could not escape that guy. He's on TV. He's on the radio, of course, with this big record I happened to work on. And it's like people would come up on the street or other musicians. I'm at the studio. They would congratulate me when they, they heard about it. They may they didn't play on it, maybe, but they heard about it. So it's a great feeling to have a, a big record like that. That was my first yeah, my first number one, nine, yeah, nine, seven, early 70s, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I can see you reflecting on on that, on the time, and I think that's, it's Lots amazing. A mo few moments like that now and then. Yeah. Even today, different, different uh, view, viewport, different things, but yeah. Mm. So, Talking about the highlights, right, of your career, mm -hmm. teaching, teaching, right? And you've done so many things with teaching. You, you know, you design instructional, you know, uh, I mean, videos and tutorials. Like, they're, you're, you're so, so loved by so many people. <laughs> and there's, there are a lot of people that are very excited that I'm interviewing you today who are really excited oh, to good, watch this good, and good, check good. it out and just love you and implore you and what you do. And as a teacher, I want to talk, I want to talk about that because again, like with Michael Benicos, you were actually not my teacher, which is, I forget that you guys were my specific teacher, but I would still go to OCs with you and meet you. And I was so happy that I discovered you both in school and, you know, the boys were telling me about you. You had Ricky and Rodolfo were like, oh, I have to go to Barry. I have to show him my mix. And I'm like, who is this Barry guy? <laughs> Yeah, she's I, talking about at Musicians Institute, and they had a they had a thing called open counseling. It was on yeah. Fridays, and uh, it was mostly about uh, engineering students. You know, they want to play their mix, they want to ask questions, so they would come come and see me. And then there was the other component, which was career counseling, which uh, is more broad. And so I would get uh, students from a guitar program or whatever. And Marie used to come in because she was near graduation and she didn't know what to do. And I think I can, I think I can take credit for ask recommending her to get into this sample uh, thing that she did started with. Uh, Absolutely. You can with uh, native instruments, right? Yep. Yeah. And uh, she tapped into that. And I said, because that's what was really kind of taken off then this idea that uh, if you're not a singer, no worries. Right. <laughs> you, could, you could buy these samples of, uh, of all phrases and licks and all kinds of stuff and then put them in your in your session, just play them on a keyboard. So I don't think that you really thought of that. I think that you were thinking more like you would graduate and, you know, there would be people beating down your door for, <laughs> ah, you know, and that's a that's a big fallacy. And they don't, you know, uh, uh, especially private schools like MI, they don't disabuse you. In other words, they don't try to convince you that that's not going to happen. And, right. and so I thought it was, it was really good that you discovered that and went out there and did the work. And a lot of this stuff takes hard work. You have to get out there and it takes hard work. So you'll find that. Uh, Thank you so you, much, Barry. You, well, sure. It's, you I'm guys glad inspired you. me a lot um, to come up with the idea. And, you know, Eddie, Eddie Towner, who I refer to also, you know, he, he really inspired me too. And it was just such a supportive environment having you, my teachers, my instructors, who I was able to show my demo that I had pitched to Native Instruments and say, hey, guys, what do you think about this? And then I even sent you the contract. And I was like, Barry, what do you think about this? And then you guys just all gave me your support. And, and I really, really to this day, um, I just always remember being lifted up like that and what that felt like to me. So it, it made all the difference in the world, uh, especially, you know, I came into the audio engineering program as a singer, mm. for those who don't know. So I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn and figure out how to bridge the two. Mm -hmm. So I felt, I still feel really fortunate that I had you guys helping to inspire me 
So that was super awesome. And I want to ask you about teaching because I think teaching is an art form. And I think it's super special that you have been able to just expand on this so much. And I mean, you have so many fans. Uh, my husband watches your videos to learn how to do stuff, you know, Ricky and all, all, of, all of our friends, the whole MI crew, I mean, they just love you. So how has teaching rewarded you and also felt like a, almost like a point of um, gratification? Like it, tell me what it's felt like for you and what you love about it being an educator because you're an excellent educator. Well, teaching is sort of a culmination of, of, things you have to stand up in front of a crowd which that's a certain part of you a certain i'm not going to say confidence but you have to kind of be ready to do that so mm. the, the oratory part is is a character builder i think and then you have to know your topic and have a plan and be able to carry that out and get your point across to all your students some get it faster and better and deeper than others, but all have to have at least some kind of a basic <laughs> understanding. So with, I started teaching at a school called Pinnacle in Alhambra. It's out of mm -hmm. business now, but anyway, and uh, trade school like MI. And uh, that was really, uh, and Francis Buckley was there, you know, Francis and yeah. well, a couple other, a couple other people that you might know, but, Anyway, mm -hmm. it was in a basement. And the first day I ran into Francis, the, uh, the last time I had seen Francis was in the basement of uh, MCA. They have studios in the, in the parking, under the parking lot of the Universal Black Tower, you know, that whole, there's studios down there. And uh, I said, Francis, and he was the chief engineer down there. I said, Francis, here we are meeting again in somebody's basement because the school was, was one, one level down. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, um, oh teaching God. is, teaching is about patience. It's about clarity. It's about using words that your student body, the students in front of you will understand and relate to. Um, and it, it, there's a lot of giving t in teaching, you know, you're, you're making a point to really give them the information, good information. And so the writing the curriculum and designing instructional design is kind of a sure. fancy term, but uh, that comes from that direction because what they had uh, when I started at MI, uh, they didn't really have that codified very well. It wasn't mm. a, a lot of problems with it. And it, it was sort of surface and kind of uh, not really oriented towards learning much of anything. I think I rewrote that probably rewrote that course probably 10 times over the time, just wow. dialing it in new technology comes in, things change. Um, so I've taught in India, went over there for a couple of weeks. Wow. That, was, that was pretty cool. Um, if you get a chance, let me know. I'll tell you all about it. It was, uh, I was in an area, an area, uh, called uh, that's the craziest names down there shawarma boomy uh-huh so shawarma boomy academy if any of you out there wow. were there and uh so i would love to know about that one day yes when i come over to pick up my fresh uh fruit next time and bring you some tiramisu. <laughs> there's tangerines and grapefruit uh, uh i think the oranges are gone but uh -huh. there's Avocados. tangerines the avocados I have to show you what the they're blossoming all oh, there's hundreds of little flowers, flowers. <laughs> we'll see if the wind doesn't blow them off or maybe it did lately we've been having wind here yeah so, it's been so windy lately yep so very cool yeah Barry I just wanted to you know just know how much the students respect you so I think it's I think it's a beautiful thing that you've taken you know a turn in your career to try to you know pay it forward almost because it's like I'm sure at some point or another, you had somebody that was kind of mentoring. You were just teaching you the ropes, you know, some things that you didn't know, because we all have to learn from someone, right? We don't just know all this stuff. So I just wanted to, you know, let you know again, how, how respected you are and um, how much, you know, be behind the scenes, how, how much the guys were just really, really 
really oh, looking forward to showing you their mixes. I mean, they it was paramount to them to be told that their mix yeah. sounded good by you. They value your opinion so much, and that was really set the Fridays bar. are always Fridays are always kind of carefree and, um, you know, yeah. Mind. But you know, I mean, in any environment, in any school, I think having a small personalized classroom environment is the most ideal case scenario. Barry, I need to know what your favorite mix of all time is that you worked on. What's what's your favorite or, or I know they're all different. Um, one that you're super proud of that just like your personal tastes. I like different mixes for different reasons. Uh, but um, one of the reasons is that it just happened. It wasn't like a struggle to get it. Mm. It just sort of happened in that I can remember that being uh, Sarah Smile on the Hollow Notes record album I did. Sarah Smile was their last uh, ditch <laughs> effort, the third single. And the record label said, look, this is it for you. If this doesn't hit, you're off the label. Literally, wow. because they, they had done an album before the silver one with Todd Rundgren called War Babies. And uh, it didn't happen. Daryl told me, he says, we, we had to stop for a while because we were taking too much LSD. He says, <laughs> the board was like bending, you know, they're in the control oh, room. Yeah. He says, we had to stop for a while. There was, you know, and, and the album was a flop. And so this album, um, Sarah was the third single. Uh, those guys are so together. I mean, unbelievable. And so... Sarah was a live vocal. We were talking about vocals earlier. So when you listen to that record, realize that Daryl sang that with the band, that vocal okay. that you're hearing. We had a little ISO booth and I, I put him in there with a U87. I remember it all. And uh, he sang with the band and Daryl's like that. He doesn't like to, he doesn't like to do stuff over and over or perfect anything. He just does it. We punched in one word, the first Sarah at the first chorus which was a little flat, he remarked and he said something like, I wish I could, wish I could fix that. And I said, you want to punch in? Cause there's a lot of room. Mm -hmm. So he went out there, one punch, boom, Sarah out. Lead vocal done. <laughs> <laughs> so that memory. And then when we mixed it, it was uh, so simple. I mean, when you listen to the song, it's 16 track you know, tape, uh, obviously, um, there is, I think four tracks of drums, mm -hmm. bass, guitar, there is a grand piano and vibraphone, which most people think is a Fender Rhodes, but it's, it's vibes when you listen to it huh. and a grand piano and, uh, and then a string section. Wow. And um, I think Can we check was, this out after I think it was nine, two and two. Uh, the producer was developing a relationship with Armin Steiner, a famous engineer in Hollywood. And he had Armin uh, come into uh, Larrabee. Actually, not. No, that was done at Sound Labs. Those strings were done at Sound Labs. But another another session he couldn't get in. Armin could not get into Sound Labs, his own studio. And so they booked Larrabee for oh. the string day. And so he came down to Larrabee and I, and I second engineered Armin and he did a, a probably it was the, what was going to be the first single. Uh, they cut the first, just to show you, the first single was a song called Camellia. I think it's song one on side one. And this is how, this is how it works in the world. That it was about a girl that John Oates met in, I think, Jamaica. And, you know, John, uh, and her name was Pamelia. And so he wrote this song, Old Pamelia. <laughs> and so he, he wrote the song and they were kind of going, he kept singing the chorus is Old Pamelia. And <laughs> everyone's kind of looking at him and go, Pamelia? Camelia, she sounds like she could be related to us. I don't know. <laughs> so he, so he, he changed it to Pamelia, the, fl the flower. Camellia. <laughs> anyway, so they cut that track, I think, four times. They did the string day twice mm -hmm. on two different takes. And it still was a dud. Didn't happen. 
and uh, and then John wrote a song called Alone Too Long and it was fun didn't happen so they're down to it so I'll tell you this is a true story their manager at the time took out I won't mention names but took out a loan a second mortgage on his house for $30,000 which is in 1977 Right. 77 was a lot. No, 76, sorry. 1976 was a lot of money. And he paid, he got 30 grand and he paid the, the program directors in 10 major markets, three grand each. Wow. And he said, play Sarah for one week in regular rotation as if it were top 10. All and right. That, and that put it over. So that whole kind of payola kind of thing is, uh, coming back although now it's called streaming and, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's yeah. something i'm learning about right now how that kind of works so yeah, yeah. so sarah smile because it's so simple straight ahead the drums are way too loud in fact we said wow these drums are really kind of loud you know yeah and we kept them <laughs> love it but with the intuition very cool barry and how about a song that you didn't work on. Do you have any other favorite songs that you really love the production on? Mm. Gosh. Um, well, I like Peter Gabriel. That's kind of old stuff. New. Let me get some new stuff. I like Dua Lipa. I think her stuff is very well. A guy actually, the producer actually lives in the Valley here. Oh, wow. He a, yeah, he's around here. Yeah, I like Dua Lipa. Um, there's a girl, uh, I like her records, uh, actually voted, for, actually nominated her. Her name is uh, Caroline, uh, if I'm saying her name right, Polarez, uh -huh. Polish, P-O-L, oh. probably mispronouncing it, Caroline mm -hmm. Polarez, I guess, P-O-L-A-R-E-Z, I think. Okay. Her stuff is pretty good. She's got a record. You should check her out. Yeah, I will. And, uh, I like Charlie XCS. I like her records. <laughs> yeah, her stuff is really fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, stuff, that stuff's good. Yeah. Okay, right on. So I want to ask you now for the for the people that are just getting started with production, can you recommend what you think might be the best budget friendly things to to purchase to just lock down kind of a basic setup? What would you recommend somebody who wants to get solid pair of headphones, solid microphone, solid interface you know and user friendly well, you, have to dog. Give me a, you have to give me a number how much you want to let's spend. go for for all of that barry let's go for four hundred dollars with a mic yeah you know a, a guy asked 50. Me, <laughs> there's a, actually a there's a this new company this new company and they their stuff is really cheap i haven't used any of it but it's called novo okay and they're advertising heavily on Facebook. And their PR guy asked me about writing about it for Music Connection. I think they have a condenser mic. It's like 125 bucks with the shock mount and everything. All right. So I don't know. My recommendation about that stuff is that get your interface, spend the money there, spend the money on speakers. And I'm assuming that that doesn't include the computer, right? Yeah, let, let's not even go, let, let, let's just do headphones right now. Headphones, I mean, people that are getting started most likely don't have the budget to do the whole speaker, the whole shebang, and people are just mixing off with their headphones to start out. And I know that's kind of like a no-no, like, it, you know, when, when you are building your mix, you need to hear them out on speakers, but like just getting started, mm -hmm. you know, assume that the computer is there, just like the components, like the software, you know, and... and oh, which, well... You probably, if you're playing your own music, you probably just want to get a Mac and Logic. Do that. That's probably very good. Logic. Mm -hmm. That's probably to to produce your own music. Pro Tools, unfortunately, is not there with their MIDI and and producing music on Pro Tools, as you probably know, is a little more cumbersome than Logic. But uh, you don't have all the features, the mixing features, and editing features that you have in Pro Tools. You don't have that in Logic. Plus, Logic has a has a toyish, a toy-like interface. I find it's too small and dinky and I don't get the sense. But if you have a Mac, it's built for that. So right. 
you're doing great. Now there, the other ones, I mean, you could use Ableton as popular for, for, for a lot of the uh, uh, EDM people, instrumental mm -hmm. stuff. Great. And, great. Uh, if you're a PC person, then you should go with Cubase if you're PC side. So the, that program's built for PCs. So awesome. If, if you're already a PC and then you just need an interface of some type, USB. I like, I mean, I'm not recommending or anything, but I like these little SSLs too, they're called. They make two different ones. They're a little bit more money, maybe. I think the most expensive one, I have the cheap one, which is two in and two out. I think it was two twenty nine. dollars Very cool. So there you go, guys. That's some really great advice. And then for, how about for headphones, Barry? Oh, uh, how much are we spending there? Under a hundred. Um, I can't honestly. <laughs> I can't I'll put you on the spot. Okay, how about two hundred? Well, you can Audio Technica, uh, uh, Sure, make some nice ones. Sennheiser, uh, you know, in that range, it all becomes what your preference is. Do you want a, you know, bright sound? accurate sound mm -hmm. sure you need to get closed back not open back i'll show you the difference i just reviewed these Let me show up on mm -hmm. okay this is where are these from lambskin but these are way more than what you're talking about but right. open back means you see how these are these are open here am i doing it right yeah yeah sound depending on how loud they are you can hear the track out of this so if i were on a microphone with these there might be a feedback so you want closed back those phones i just showed you were 400 okay. same company makes these these are 1200 wow back. they make headphones up to four thousand dollars i mean it just depends on what you're looking for but get closed back mm -hmm. closed back are like uh like Audio Technica makes clothes back. In other words, it, it's trapped. The sound is on your head. It's not going to leak out. And make sure they fit well on your head so you don't get, you don't, you know, put them on your head. So you'll see people with one ear off. That's fine if you're rehearsing. But think about it. If you're singing soft, like as about as loud as I'm talking right now, which many singers, look at Billy Eilish. Mm -hmm. he doesn't sing any louder than about this. And so if you have loud headphones on, it's, it's going to feed back. Yes. And as a, as a singer, I, producers always think that I'm crazy because I like the mix to be so low and I do keep my one ear off and I almost only want to hear the rhythm because I can you hear. Get a, you should get a one, one ear headphone, only one. I've seen those before. And that's how they in, did it back in, in the day. As, and mm -hmm. Back in the day, all the backing <laughs> singers all had one and some of them used to take the the strap off of it and they just hold the, and because, you know, when you're, you learn to sing with your voice in a room coming back at you. Yes. That's how you yes. learn to pitch and everything else. And it's, it's an artificial world to have stereo, <laughs> stereo sound, you know, with reverb or whatever you have on the vocal. That is so artificial compared to how you learn to sing. So a lot of first time singers in the studio have, pitching problems because mm -hmm. they're not used to that world but back in the day they one headphone and it was just a cheap piece of junk and they would either hold it on their ear if they had their they just got their hair done and they didn't want to <laughs> <laughs> and they also they also would rock it off their ear a little bit so that they could hear it hear their own voice right and mm -hmm. and then when it was time when the red light is on they would they would cut it off you know put it back on there so yes guys this is like a million dollar tip if you're a singer and you're getting started in the booth i mean keep that one ear off it's you're gonna psych yourself out so bad and i've seen so many singers t tell me that that's what they go through once they get in the in the recording studio they're like it just didn't feel right i couldn't i just wasn't myself i wasn't singing it as myself yeah, take, and take i said one ear off was make your sure, headphone set up take yeah. one ear off make sure the one you're taking off is sealed like usually you just put it on your back of your head like that right so or yeah. get one headphone which is even better way to do it mm -hmm. yeah probably, probably got a few broken sets of headphones that only one side works <laughs> take one of those i mean 
There you go. I know you can be creative. <laughs> After all, you are you are working on uh, a performance, and you're working on all those things. It's not about mix. It's not about hearing yourself within some final mix record. That's you're working. You're this is work. You're doing you're doing something that has enables focus. You don't want to. I don't want to be distracted anyway by some big lush reverb sound and delays mm -hmm. and all that stuff that's distracting for me so you know, for me it's like i don't sing but you'd want the vocal up i usually try to get singers not to have any reverb because it's so nice that when you do get a good performance you know whatever you think is a good performance good pitch timing all that stuff right. technical things that when you do put the reverb on it, it just sounds glorious. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The, for me, the reverb distracts me. And a lot of producers already set up the rig and they have the reverb on it. I'm like, can you take the reverb off? Take yeah, reverb good off. for you. No. <laughs> also, in that mode, you're able to hear whether or not the, the compressor is squashing too much if you're using one. And, you know, the, sure. the general tonality of your voice, especially on playback. And if there's an issue there, you'll hear it right away. You won't hear it necessarily with a bunch of reverb and delays and stuff all over it. So go go with the super dry sound. Uh, some people don't have anything in the, they don't have any other uh, vocal in the phone, only track. Yeah. That's real old school. That's how I like to do it. Yeah, only time. track. And that's good. You can really zero in on pitching and timing because you're all you're hearing is, you know, the beat and some kind of pitch reference, whatever is in the track. Right. And then it's like, as in, you know, your artist, when your artist is in the recording booth, they want to just be focusing right on their performance and delivering the best thing possible that they can to you. So I think sometimes slapping all that extra stuff on can be distracting for, just for, for my personal preference. But then I know yeah. other singers that really like it and it helps get them to that level. It helps them feel confident. Everyone's like, different. It, yeah. Everyone. Mm -hmm. And it depends what they're going for too. You know what I mean? Like if I was post Malone, I would definitely, you know, love to hear my vocal mix you know kind of sounding like what it's going to sound like on the record to get myself in the zone because you know it's it's a thing it's an it's a special tone it's a special timbre that that he has going so yeah it's all to preference right barry <laughs> coolest and most favorite helpful tools that you've seen throughout the years because you review so many things and so many products and gear and equipment and what's helped you hack the best uh you know in the studio production process Some uh, i think I think having a good set of speakers and in a, in a room that's acoustically pretty good. Uh, for example, I'm talking on a mic that's almost two feet from me. So uh, this is just my control room. And um, sounds great. So you, so that to me, because when you hear too much bass or not enough bass or it's overly shrill and bright, um, that, that affects that just affects everything so i'm working very hard to have an even even tighter control room um this is all technology that nobody needs to know about but that's that's it is for me i mean it's, it's what i it's not any one piece of gear really um when i got the studio all going it was way too dry and dead in here and so i had i had the carpeted taken up and they refinished the floor and it added just a, a right amount of splash. Mm -hmm. you know? And because uh, otherwise the room is totally absorptive. You can't really see for this camera view, but it is mm. <laughs> dead. Yes, guys. Barry has a very beautiful, cozy studio with awesome lighting and it, it's got a vibe. So your, your studio setup should have a vibe, okay? Very important stuff. I've got a vibe here, you know, we have Valentine's Day flowers. I've got my bow for California because that's where Barry is. You know, set your vibe. We have our chameleon here, it's super important. And also, you know, artists love their vibe in, in the studio environment too. Light some candles, burn some incense, or don't burn some incense, have hot tea or have room temperature tea, all those things, right, Barry? Yeah, yeah, you can get all that stuff going when I have, uh, I don't do a lot. I do some vocals here. I can do a vocal here, but mostly some overdubs, but not mm. enough room to do uh, too much. One, I can do one singer back there where the gold records are. Uh-huh. Like there. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Like that. 
Wow. <laughs> um, that's carpeted floor. And sometimes they do vocals back there. Shut the door. Ah. And... I would like to test that out one day. <laughs> and sometimes in the hallway right there in the, in the, in the space right before that room is a hallway. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway. Sweet spots. You find yeah, your I sweet spots. Yeah, you can work it out. We work it out. Error. <laughs> I love it. All right. So now I want to ask you some fun stuff. We're going to get to some trivia, Barry. Okay. So right. these are like very quick questions that I want you to just answer organically the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. They're going to be easy and then they're going to get a little harder. All right. So just starting off the top, we're going to, I'm asking you, what is your preference, beer or wine? <laughs> Depends on the wine. Oh, okay. Let's assume it's really good wine, like Rufino, wine. Amarone. Well, depends on, you know, depends on what's going on. I like beer and wine. I mean, <laughs> wine. You only pick wine. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll say wine. All right. How about Monopoly or poker? Ugh. <laughs> Neither. <laughs> Were you a roulette kind of guy or... <laughs> What, the times that I've been to Las Vegas, I'm at the crap table. All right. Okay. Very craps, cool. Craps, craps have the best odds. Okay. Very cool. <laughs> and football or soccer? Any preference on that? Um, soccer. All right. Do so you prefer the beach or nature walks? Uh, I would say nature walk because I... Pretty fair skin, so I get burned pretty easy. Uh -huh. I'd say right. nature walk. Yeah. All right. Right on. How about Italian food or Thai food? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I like good, either one, very good. I like, I say Italian, good Italian. All right, good Italian. My mom well, was a, a gourmet chef, so I. Now, was your mom a Sicilian one, or was that your father? Your mom. No, my mom is Sicilian Ooh. and uh, gourmet cook, written there up in know. magazines and all that. So, oh my gosh. Yeah, that's a tough. Do you have any recipes <laughs> for my? No, she told me how to make. You know, she, <laughs> She told me how to make the sugo and everything. And that's pretty simple. You know? Yeah. I love it. I didn't know you cook, Barry. Ooh. <laughs> Do you want to tell us some of your, I, I'll tell you one of my sugo secrets. If you tell me one of yours. What for the gravy? Yeah. Oh, um, I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> I like to use, I like to use Italian sausage. Yeah. Where you, you know, where you, you Definitely. brown that, yes, you brown that first. Mm -hmm. um, but it's pretty standard. I, I mean, my mom told me about her, certain relatives that do this, that, and the other, but fresh ingredients. I mean, I don't know. I get sure. the tomato paste. Yep. You know, get the tomato so paste. My secret tip is with the tomato paste. Check this out. I got this from Lydia Bastianic. What yeah. she does is she toasts the tomato paste in a hot pocket in the pan you know, the onions are on one side and then she gets a hot pocket and she just toasts the tomato paste, lets the acidity come out of it for like a few minutes. And it makes all the difference in my sauce. In a hot pocket, did you say? Yeah, not like, <laughs> not like the snack hot pocket that you put in the microwave. Oh, I, I mean, like <laughs> in the pan, you, you have your onions sautéing and your garlic yeah, and you yeah. shove them over to the side and then you leave like one open spot in the pan and you just put your tomato paste right there. Okay. And it helps the acid release because sometimes... Sauce gets so acidic, right? Uh, yeah. Try yeah. that. Well, and I will try any more Italian. Well, you, I usually add Italian sausage in my sauce. Oh, and you got to have a, you got to do the garlic. Well, the garlic you can saute along with the sausage if you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because the, the sausage is making making the oil. And then, uh, you know, the olive oil, of course, a yes. little bit. Oh my gosh. What kind of olive oil do you buy, Barry? I'm leaning into uh, you now. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> There's a great one from Costco. It's Tuscan. Tuscan oh, yeah. olive oil is very good. Since uh -huh. we're talking about Italy, I'm just going to go off in a little olive oil tangent and say that every region of Italy has different olive oil. That's right. And they're all famous for, for different for different things. It's like mm -hmm. pesto is in Genova. And mm -hmm. then, you know, there, there's a lot of cool stuff. But we'll do another. A good olive oil for pesto. Yeah. A good olive oil for pesto. Um, I... I really default to the Tuscan olive oil because it's so muted. It's got a little bit of a, a spice to it in a weird way though. But I like that because I think your pesto should have a little kick to it. But if you prefer less kick and a little more just flavor, go with the Sicilian olive oil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's Greek olive oil and Spanish olive oil too. They all have different characteristics, but it's all to your preference, right? 
So yep. back to your preferences, Barry. Okay, coffee or tea? And I'm taking coffee. notes of all this. Coffee, okay. And chocolate or vanilla ice cream? A chocolate. Okay. Pineapple on pizza or not? No, that's <laughs> sacrilegious. I don't like that. That's <laughs> wrong. It's so wrong. Oh, asking that question, it gets people so upset. <laughs> There's a video upsetting. of someone delivering a pizza to, to someone's house in Naples and uh, the, the very Italian Napolitano man takes yeah. the pizza box and throws it back at them. So yeah. it makes Italians very upset when you put Yeah, it I mean, if you're, if you're on 8th <laughs> Avenue, if you're on 8th Avenue in New York City, you know, there's a slice places all over the place. Yeah, for sure. If you said something like in there, they probably get, you probably get murdered. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, I worked in a few of those, so I can attest to that. Uh, fedoras or snapbacks? What's a what? A what back? Fedora or snapbacks, like baseball cap hats? Fedora. Yeah, I knew that. Okay, okay. <laughs> comedy or drama? Well, drama. I don't. I only watch one comedy show. I've seen it a million times. I still watch it because it's stupid. Oh, which so, one? Two and a Half Men. <laughs> show that is a great show i, love I mean show. it's so tired and <laughs> misogynistic and all the all the wrong things but it's still on television the humor is, it's still funny stuff though you can't like, it is you can't hilarious the jokes. But, yeah okay now they're gonna get a little harder okay madonna or Cher? well i worked with Cher years ago wow. she's so sweet so nice but i i love Cher. i think nowadays madonna mm. Cher is yeah i mean She's very nice. I used to talk with her all the time and in the, in the control room. I worked on Half Breed and um, some other stuff she did. So. Awesome. All right. Very cool. Now, how about Michael Jackson or James Brown? James, well, different eras. I know. That's kind I know. Of I told you they were going to get harder. <laughs> well, but James Brown, it's a different era and he different times and he Michael is very influenced by James Brown, too. Of course. Um, you can stay Switzerland if you want for this one. I won't hold it against you. I just remember James Brown. I mean, going to see him, and it was like the whole cape thing and everything. And that guy, we didn't know it at the time, but that guy was pretty amazing. And and uh, things like that. I just remember going to those shows. Like, you know, I, I went to a concert where Jimi Hendrix played twice in one weekend. Wow. You know, it was a festival in uh, Northridge. Oh my gosh. On the, it was on the, uh, what used to be called the uh, Polo Grounds. What is it? Well, you see it on Facebook. You'll see announcements about it, but there was a Devonshire, Devonshire Downs Polo Ground. It was just totally unorganized, of course. Right, just like right. kind of like Woodstock, except not as big. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, Jimmy played two nights, Friday and and came back on Saturday, but that was pretty cool. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, I wish. I wish I could have seen that. Mm -hmm. All right, so from Michael Jackson to James Brown, we're not really, it's two different art. Okay, I, I got you. I know, it was a hard question, but I had to do it to you. I'm sorry, I had to. Okay, <laughs> here's, here's maybe an easier one. Slate digital or warm audio? Warm audio. Okay, all right. How about the Valhalla Reverb plugin or... Outboard lexicon. I don't have the lexicon. I, I know Valhalla. I would say the lexicon right now. Yeah. Valhalla is nice. The, out, the outboard one. Valhalla makes an outboard reverb? No, for, for lexicon, I'm asking you. I'm essentially asking like outboard reverbs or like digital, digital reverb. Well, I have an AMS reverb here mm -hmm. in hardware. I like okay. it. Okay. Um, it's kind of like, you know, when you talk about a digital reverb, it's still computer code and all that. It's just in a box yeah. powered. So I would say I'm pretty much on software. Reverb. All right, cool. Yeah. I mean, I've heard people say that the outboard lexicon and the digital are like pretty, pretty spot on. They're nice. Brecasti is a well-known, really Brecasti. liked reverb, but I have a plugin that's the same thing. It's a Brecasti mm. reverb plugin. Mm. I mean, it doesn't say Brecasti on it. If you're interested, it's called uh, Seventh Heaven. It's the name of the 
Well, the last thing I have written on here was analog or digital, but I think after this conversation, it's safe to assume that you're progressive and you're moving forward. You know, you have real respect for the- but That's a, that's a kind stuff, of a, but... that's a, that's an, in, it's, it's not a decision. It's, I can't record multi-track tape recorders but some analog gear is better at what it does. I'll tell you, here's how I look at it. Okay. I like the software plugins when they do things that you can't do uh, in analog. So in other words, a plugin like um, Gatekeeper. I don't know if you know that one. Uh -huh, I've heard of it. Gatekeeper is a, it's like a gate, but you can program. Anyway, Gatekeeper, you can't do that with, with, with the hardware. Uh, there's a lot like that. So what does Gatekeeper do? It's a gate, but is it, isn't it also a, um, um, a compressor as well? No, it's a, it's a programmable uh, gate, but you can trigger it, sync it to tempo, and you can trigger the shapes of each opening and shutting. So and that's amazing. Can take, you can put a pad into it, for example, like a sustaining pad and make it, make it do that, that EDM pulse thing if you want. Mm. It's pretty cool. And there's a lot of plugins yeah. like that, a lot. So I'm automatically uh, there with most of that stuff. Some of the limiters are fantastic. Things that you cannot do either in real time. In other words, uh, you, I mean, there's no impulse response reverb other than the Bricasti. Mm. Okay, I'm getting technical, sorry, but. No, no, it's okay. That, that was the question, you're, you're dead on. <laughs> Also, well, thank you for all those insights. And I asked you a lot of these questions because when I come for my fruits and my bag of fresh, fresh groceries, I want to have things that I can give you and to say thank you. <laughs> oh, well, you're welcome. To, you're welcome to come over anytime. Like I said, the uh, there's still grapefruit. There's still some tangerines. Uh, oranges are gone. and there's, uh, You have the best fruit. fruit. His various fruit trees are awesome. <laughs> too, too soon for avocados. Too soon for avocados. Okay. Yeah. So the last thing that I want to ask you, Barry, because it's it's really important to me to always put health and wellness into the conversation of the industry. I think that it's not talked about enough how um, people in this business, what they're doing to stay balanced in their life. And I wanted to ask you, you know, now and throughout your career, have you had any outlets that have helped you kind of take yourself out of the work for a second? And is there anything that you well, do for yourself? Exercise, exercise. Cause you know, I go every three miles every morning. Oh, great. You know? And then um, I also, you know, one of the things I did when I was coming up uh, was I used to, when I was first married, we used to buy houses and fix them up and sell them. And um, uh, that's something you can think about doing. I don't know. I have lots of stories about that stuff. Yeah, I used to have a house. Used to own a house in the top of Laurel Canyon up there, overlooking, overlooking Laurel Canyon, up lookout yeah, sure. you know the area. Yeah. Way on the top, and uh, that was my second house. And I had Beautiful a house home in Sherman there. Oaks, and so that's something that you know. A project. <laughs> projects like that, you know. Uh, uh, painting, uh, replacing stuff, mm -hmm. uh, thing, you know, things like that, that you can do without having to uh, call in a crew. So we, right. Just to give your mind that break, do something yeah. totally different for a minute not think about. And to a certain extent, certain the writing, my writing does that too, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to a certain extent. Uh, so that's another outlet, although it's not energetic. In other words, I'm not moving around while I'm, while I'm typing, but it is. <laughs> It is a, a mental and mentally anyway, it's a change up. Um, but yeah, actually you gotta, you gotta try to stay in shape. I mean, I think. Yeah, definitely. I completely agree with you. Well, that was an amazing episode. Thank you so much for all of your time today. I really, really appreciate this Barry. Uh, and thank you for watching chameleons. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Send us your questions and comments below. Be sure to like, and subscribe to this video and follow us both on Instagram, follow Barry at Barry mixer and me at chameleon cuts, subscribe to my YouTube channel at queen chameleon and Barry, if it's okay with you for uh, anyone to contact you, um, let me know if we can keep give out your email or we'll just put your Instagram down there and we'll see you guys next time. Good deal. Thanks Instagram, Instagram is good. Barry mixer. And, um, we'll do another one. Part All two. Right. Yes. More technical if you want. Yes. We're going to do a part two episode. Also exactly. We're going to talk about, you know, 
going deep into the stuff that Barry likes to do. And I would actually love it if we could give you maybe one of my vocal, just I'll, I'll put together something vocal. Maybe you could go in and show us, screen share with us and show us how you go in and edit a vocal. Whatever, yeah. you, whatever you want. That would be awesome. Okay. Thank you so much and see you guys next time. And remember to always express yourself and rock all your shades. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah.